my name is Carla Delgado. I am a graphic designer at Pentagram in Austin, Texas. Um, I've been there off and on uh, since I graduated from the University of Texas. And I've been with them uh, sort of off and on since I graduated. Uh, I've been there now for about eight years. Um, so at Pentagram, I, my projects range from brand identity to packaging, uh, a little bit of web design. Um, but my passion is editorial design, which is what I'm going to be um, talking mostly about here today. So just to give you a little bit of background on Pentagram, uh, Pentagram is an international design company with five offices, uh, New York, London, Berlin, San Francisco, and Austin. There are currently 21 partners, all with um, various expertise ranging from motion graphics to architecture to print design uh, to video, sort of every and everything in between. So this is the Austin office um, on our recent retreat uh, in Mexico. And I love this picture so much because it really sort of um, says so much about our team. Um, we, we love each other a lot. Uh, we're kind of like one big family. Um, and we clearly don't take, e take ourselves uh, too seriously. Um, there, there are 10 of us in the Austin office, six designers, two interns, an office manager, and then the partner in charge, DJ Stout, their second from the left. Um, he, his uh, area of expertise is um, editorial design as well. He was the art director for Texas Monthly Magazine for 15 years prior to joining Pentagram. Um, and uh, he, he's certainly one of the most well-regarded and um, highly esteemed editorial designers working today. Um, so you know, clearly, he's definitely the most influential person so far in my career. Um, but I actually discovered my love for editorial design um, during my off time at Pentagram, which is what I'm going to kind of kind of start out with. So, um, as I said before, um, I I started working at Pentagram when I graduated from college, and at the time I worked uh, primarily on branding projects, which for the most part I really enjoyed. Um, until I started working on a few um, just really big kind of mundane corporate projects. And I started to feel like all I was doing was really trying to make businesses more profitable. Um, a lot of times we were, we were hi hired by companies, um, and still are, uh, to revamp their identity. Um, a lot of times with the bottom line of you know, becoming more profitable. And, and as, as cheesy as it sounds, I, I was really kind of um, desiring for my work to hold a, a greater purpose than that. Um, and so, you know, being my first job right out of college, um, I decided that even though I didn't really know what that greater purpose looked like or what that was, it, it felt like a reason to um, essentially leave my dream job a uh, year after graduation and um, make the most logical place, make, make the most logical move um, to a border town in Texas uh, as a designer. Um, my uh, boyfriend at the time, now husband, was teaching there, and so I decided to kind of give it a shot and take a risk, and, and I moved down to Brownsville, Brownsville, Texas. Uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective about where exactly it is, um, this is a street sign just a few blocks from my neighborhood when I, when I was living in Brownsville. Um, so it's definitely a border town in every stretch of the word. Um, as you can imagine, not the most design-centered place to live, um, and you know, not the most forward-thinking place. But it certainly had a lot of community, um, and um, it's, it still has a, a soft place in my heart. Um, so I really had no idea what I was going to do when I moved down there. I didn't have a job, um, but I ended up getting a position at the local newspaper, the Brownsville Herald, as a page designer. Um, this was definitely something completely new for me, uh, definitely a, a big departure from what I had been doing at Pentagram. Um, but uh, it, was, it was sort of what I was looking for, something completely different. So this is the newsroom. Um, and as sort of mundane and straight out of the 1970s as it looks, uh, I really enjoyed the newsroom environment a lot. Uh, much like Pentagram, it was very collaborative. Just the newspaper in general is just a very collaborative environment with reporters and editors and photographers. 
uh, and designers all working together to produce a product on a daily basis. Um, and so when I first started, I worked mostly, I worked in the daytime, so I worked mostly on the, the lifestyle section. Um, so I was laying out stories about uh, local elementary school artists, uh, about small business owners, and um, about stories like the, um, the border fronts and how it was affecting the community. Eventually, I got the opportunity from time to time to uh, do the front page of the paper, which was really exciting. Um, and I'm the first to admit these designs are certainly far from groundbreaking. Um, but, you know, the newspaper by, by nature is pretty steeply limited um, in terms of how creative you can be, and, and it was also very new to me. Um, but it really was, the job was really about so much more than that. Um, uh, the, the design was sort of secondary because what I loved the most about the job was the product itself. I loved the idea that um, this newspaper was being disseminated across um, the Brownsville community on a daily basis, and I had I played a role in, in providing that for the community. Um, a, a place like Brownsville still really values the printed newspaper, and so I'd see um, guys on the street corner in the morning selling the newspaper. Almost every home in my neighborhood had the newspaper delivered. Um, and so it was just really exciting to see this sort of, this, this thing that I was providing um, for the community. Um, so the most, the most, uh, the biggest highlight of my time at the Herald, um, and, and really is the, the most pivotal moment of my, of my career thus far, um, was when I was in the airport one weekend uh, traveling home, and I was in the terminal and looked, looked over, and there was an older gentleman just sitting there reading the newspaper. I think it was the business, the business section that I had designed the day before. Um, and he was taking in the stories and was interested in the stories that I had chosen to put in the paper the day before, um, that I had arranged in the layout. And it was such a simple moment, um, but it really stuck with me. Um, and, and it was that moment that I really realized what I loved the most about design. Um, and that is its ability to um, provide something meaningful to specific communities. And so this man who really valued the news, um, it was something that I could provide for him. Um, even though he was pretty, was completely oblivious to the design itself, that, that's not what mattered. What mattered was that he was taking in something that I had helped to, to provide for him. And so, um, so that's really what has stuck with me and, um, and you know, just this idea of being able to, to provide for the community in a meaningful way. Um, and so really since then, my heart has lied in editorial design, and, and that's sort of what I've been working on ever since. So um, I was at the Herald for about a year before I, uh, my, my husband and I moved to Phoenix, where I worked at a kind of small design studio, um, sort of refining my editorial craft. Um, lived there for about a year and got, got out of Phoenix as fast as we could. Um, uh, and headed back to Austin. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to get rehired at Pentagram. They, they happened to have a, a spot open again. And um, so I got hired again. And this time I told DJ that I was ready for some magazines. Um, so as I said before, I still work on a lot of branding projects um, and, and, you know, various other um, sort of topics. But editorial is what, I've, what I focus most on. Um, so it's really fitting that the first community that I got to design for back at Pentagram was for, the, was for my hometown. So this is a magazine called Giving City, and it's all about um, local philanthropy and um, nonprofit work in the city. Um, and so the, the launch issue was um, about, we had, a few years back we had some, which I know you guys are sort of familiar with, we had some really devastating wildfires in the summer, um, and there was a big relief effort for that. So. Um, so this was, a, this was a redesign of an existing publication, and it was distributed primarily through local businesses where other sort of free takeaways um, were sort of alongside it. And um, so for this, for this publication, we, we really wanted it to, to stand out uh, amongst all of the other clutter that it was going to be next to. So we came up with this really bold headline treatment where we just have one big headline um, across the entire cover. 
Um, and we were able to get away with doing the masthead really small down the side. Um, and this was an example of something where the client really trusted us and trusted that we were, um, we were the um, experts she, she hired, and, um, and so she went with it. Uh, we pr produced four issues for them. Um, second issue was, um, was about um, how to volunteer and contribute uh, with families and, and kids. Uh, then there was an issue about um, innovative ph philanthropists in Austin. Um, and then this last issue was about the uh, Ballet Austin and the Nutcracker and how it had over decades um, really contributed to, commu to the community in a lot of ways. Um, so what we really tried to do with this publication was um, sort of keep it very kind of clean and simple, um, but also have lots of um, areas of, of varying hierarchy. Um, so this was the, the opening news section, so just kind of short, a bunch of short, short stories um, that we uh, sort of arrange so that the reader has kind of different points of entry. Um, again, just keeping the design really clean and straightforward, um, and nothing too tricky or cutesy. Um, and then this was the um, opening page for the cover story about the Bastrop wildfire. So we tried to do something that kind of mimicked the cover treatment a little bit. And it was a, it's a small publication, really kind of a half, half sheet size. And so we, we still wanted to use photography in a big way to kind of help it feel a little bit more substantial. Um, so we tried to use a lot of big, big imagery. Again, different points of entry. This was another a short feature um, where we had kind of a short story on the left and then some different bullet points in the middle and then um, some, some kind of statistics towards the bottom. And then this was the story about, the, about Ballet Austin and the Nutcracker. And um, what was really interesting here was instead of, we sort of had a different take on it. So instead of kind of doing the, the more expected um, photographs of the production itself and the dancers. We focused on the costumes because the costumes had been around for years and years and years. So they, they themselves really spoke to um, the, the ballet's impact um, over the course of you know, the last few decades. You, can cut, you, cut, you could kind of see their, um, their wear and tear in the photographs, but a couple of interior layouts. So uh, another community that I've gotten to design for is for Drexel University, which is in Philadelphia. And um, this is actually one of my most favorite projects that I've had the opportunity to work on. Um, they hired us to redesign their research publications, so all about the various research projects that they have going on uh, on campus. Everything from um, biology to robotics to law and education. Um, and so we decided to sort of capitalize on the fact that they have an X in their name, which is pretty unique, and it, it also has kind of a, the X is pretty scientific just alone. Um, so we did this really big graphic treatment with the X um, that wrapped around from the back to the front cover. And then by, in terms of the masthead, by wrapping the word Drexel around, starting with a D on the back cover, the R is on the spine, and then EXEL is on the front, so the, the publication came to be called Excel. Um, so we sort of created a new, a new name for the magazine. And this, this was the launch issue and was about, um, this, this particular feature was about a really amazing butterfly collection that they have at their Academy of Natural Sciences. So we hired a photographer to go shoot these butterflies and um, just kind of a really, really strike, made for a really striking cover. Um, we've done four issues for them so far. It's an annual, so we only get to do it once a year. But um, but it makes it, it gives us the opportunity to really um, to really go heavy and um, and uh, sort of call out all the stops uh, for each issue. So the second issue was about endangered fish in um, in the Amazon. Uh, this third one over here on the on the bottom left was about um, some students that had created a, a a farming tool for rice farmers in Thailand that they built out of blue PVC pipe. 
Um, and then this last one was really, really amazing. Um, it, the feature was about a, um, the largest plant-eating dinosaur ever found. Uh, that was, it's called the Dreadnoughtus. Um, and it was discovered by a Drexel researcher in South America. Um, so for th the main goal for this publication was to really take all of this really, uh, a lot of times scientific and complex um, content and really make it so that it's uh, accessible to most of their readers, because um, most of the, the readers aren't necessarily researchers, and if they are, they aren't all versed in um, you know, robotics or molecular biology. And so uh, we started, um, we really started that off by, um, by a really, really, really visual TOC to kind of um, to, to grab people in and, um, and sort of really captivate the reader. So the larger stories are the features and the smaller, the smaller stories are um, the various departments in the magazine. Um, and then we start, we start the magazine off by um, sh just showing some really beautiful full spread imagery. Uh, in this issue, it was, uh, we featured these photographs that were, uh, they're microscopic photographs that the students had taken and then hand colored after the fact. Um, and so this one was colored to look like the, the Drexel dragon is their mascot. These I think are, um, are um, octopus tentacles. Uh, that they colored to look like little eating monsters. And this was another in that series. Um, and then for, for all, of, all of the department sections, we, um, we start with a, with, su with a story that just has really great imagery. Um, so this was about this professor that was doing uh, work with fish um, and had this, these really great x-rays that, that I think we compiled all into one image. So again, really playing up the visuals of the research, less about the researchers themselves, you know, pointing at the, the computer screen, um, and more about the, the actual images themselves, because they, they alone are, are pretty amazing. This is another opener about this very large turtle. And then this is one, an interior spread from one of these department sections where Keep the stories pretty, pretty concise, pretty brief, um, and just kind of pepper it with different size imagery and um, and pulling out numbers and pull quotes. Again, that idea of multiple entry points to kind of keep the reader engaged. Um, and then one of the things that we do a lot in Drexel, which is another one of my favorite things, and uh, what my workshop is going to be about, is our infographics. Um, again, for the accessibility factor, we do a lot of infographics in this magazine to try to um, explain things less with words and more th with visuals, um, because that's often what people respond to most and can relate to a little bit more. Um, so these are all about taking some of the images that the researchers give us and figure out um, interesting ways to, to compose the page, sometimes using stock. Um, a lot of times using, um, doing uh, illustrated icons and things. There are a few more of those, um, those infographic pages. So this sort of breaks up those um, more, more text-heavy pages. And then this was the, the um, interior design for that cover story about the butterflies. So it's really, really the entire story is um, mostly really great photographs with extended captions. So this, this publication, and like most that we do, it's really all about um, trying to figure out the best way to tell a story. Um, sometimes that's through a lengthy article. Sometimes it's through big, beautiful images like this one. Sometimes it's an infographic. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's a more conceptual topic. Um, this, uh, this story was about um, Hugo Chavez, and so it was something that made more sense to have illustrated, so we, we hired this really great illustrator who concepted this image for us. And then this was, this was one of the stories where we were given really great imagery from Drexel. Um, they, they had had these robots photographed in sort of a studio setting, um, and so we sort of 
enhanced the photographs by doing these little pull-out captions that talk about various aspects of the, of the robots. Um, and then this was that, that, the cover with all of the little tiny fish. Um, and here we were given just a bunch of field uh, photographs that the researcher had taken out in the field where he was holding up the fish like this sort of in front of the camera. So we had a really, really gracious intern clip out every single little fish um, and uh, really tried to make this a bit more of an artful, artful feature. Um, and then sometimes the best solution was a typographic one. So this was a story about uh, research that they were doing using fruit flies um, in relation to uh, human safe pesticide. And so they had given us a bunch of kind of, you know, normal photos of, uh, of fruit flies. And we, we took them in Photoshop and inverted them so they came sort of blue neon and then sort of use that to, to um, inspire and inform this um, really graphic layout. This is just another one of my favorite um, stories that was about malaria. So we just found a stock photo of a mosquito, made it huge. So we're playing here with scale um, in a really big way and then um, turned it grayscale so that we really isolated and enhanced the, the red belly. Another one of my favorite features. Um, this was about these endangered monkeys on, on some chain of islands. So trying to pull in some emotion, sort of an emotional response with imagery like this. Um, so this is an entirely different publication for an entirely different community. This one was for the, the um, I'm sorry, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, this is their donor publication, so it goes, all, goes to all of their higher level donors. Um, and we, we really wanted to create an art piece with this magazine. Um, so the first thing that we came up with to do was to make each issue a theme. So uh, the, the launch issue was, uh, is about water. And so every story in the magazine in one way or another relates to water in, in some way. Um, and then we did this really graphic H on the front using this really beautiful um, stencil typeface that allowed us to um, do a die cut of part of the H that then reveals a standalone story on the, on the inside. So the, this is a feature about Monet and the influence of the Seine River um, on his work. And so um, we did this big pull-out map that um, sort of indicates all of the different places on the Seine River um, where he painted some of his paintings. So again, trying to think of different ways to, to sort of pull the reader in and tell stories in a different way. This was told through a, just a really big pull quote, um, just standalone spread. Um, and then this was sort of a, a more diagrammatic approach where we um, are explaining the, this object, which is a daguerreotype in their collection, um, through a kind of a short story. And then we've done kind of a, a diagram of the daguerreotype down there in the left corner and then captioned it off to indicate the different aspects of the, of the object. Again, playing with scale. Uh, this is this is a, actually a pretty small little shell in their collection that we that we blew up really large on the spread to to really hone in on the detail that we've then um, sort of pulled out and indicated in captions on the bottom left. And then this is the second spread of that feature, where playing with scale again. These are these are not proportionate to each other. We just wanted to make a really visual and sort of artful layout with the with the images of these objects. So like the, the pelican there at the top is, is actually a pendant on a necklace, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how we're playing with scale. Um, and then this was a, a feature in the same issue about water, about um, these photographers that did this photo series of water towers. So this is also about, um, this magazine is also about um, 
sort of interpreting the theme in, a, in sort of a loose way. So you get these really interesting juxtapositions like this pretty contemporary photo series of, of um, water towers juxtaposed against the, um, the, the paintings by Monet. And then this is another sort of diagrammatic approach again, similar to the daguerreotype, playing the scale again. Um, and then this is another pullout that we did uh, where the story was about this screen and the different motifs that are um, that are often in these these Korean screens, um, and so we did these little silhouetted icons um, derived from the the various uh, motifs in the in the screen, and then had little captions about what they signify. And then this was sort of similar to that quote spread, um, where the whole story is really told by this this long quote. Um, which uh, points out different details of this piece of piece of art. Um, and so then this this is another one of the publications that I'm most proud of. Uh, this is a magazine that we do for the World Wildlife Fund. Um, they hired us to really revamp their whole suite of publications for their members. Um, and so we uh, we created this um, this magazine for them where we started with the um, the masthead in this outlined type to sort of symbolize the fact that World Wildlife is the content of the magazine. They, they're made up by these stories. And our, our, our concept in terms of imagery was another one that we were really excited that the client went with because um, it's definitely unconventional, but we start with, with some kind of texture, that uh, sort of a macro texture that um, that relates to one of their uh, one of their projects, so that when you open the first the opening spread, this is called the reveal. Um, and you sort of reveal what that um, what that cover texture was, and then it has a, a standalone story as well. So this obviously was about elephant ivory. Um, and we've done, we've produced eight issues for them. We are working on the ninth currently. This is a quarterly publication. Um, so some of the, you can see some of the textures are more obvious than others, so it sort of ranges. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of the suite of covers as they, as they stand. Um, and one of the, one of the things, one of the main goals WWF had for this magazine was to really showcase the breadth of their, their work in conservation, that they're really not, they're, they're, they're about so much more than animals. So they work with communities around the world to um, protect the environment and, and are conscientious of climate change. Um, and so they're, they're really, they really take a more holistic approach, approach to conservation. And so we, we started off by um, creating a, a table of contents for them that really kind of showcases in each issue, the breadth of their work around the globe. So each story is assigned a country, depending on the topic, um, and then indicated on the map. Um, and then again, this this we, we tried to tell um, different stories in different ways in this publication, just like the previous ones that I've shown. And so one of the one of the pages, one of the departments in this magazine is called Object of Conservation. Um, and it's where we photograph a, typically photograph a, um, an object in a studio setting and then have captions and diagrammatic elements that, that sort of tell the story of this object and, and what its purpose is. This was in the launch issue and it was about a camera trap. And we, we had, it was really neat because we had a local photographer in town build this whole diorama scene. Um, so he acquired this deer um, and built this whole scene. Nothing was photoshopped. Um, and then this is, these are three other examples of that same page, that object conservation. Got a, like a, a fish hook down there, and then a sniffer dog's nose, um, and then a, a cooking stove. And this is one of my favorite pieces in the, in the magazine. It's called Caught in the Act, and it features just a, a really arresting image of a moment in nature that was caught on film. Um, so something like a, a chameleon just about to catch its prey or a, a penguin uh, about to hit the water. 
Um, and then this is another, um, another section that's one of our favorites. It's called Gallery. And here we, fe we try to feature um, artists that have done some kind of work relating to animals. And so a lot of times we feature photographers. This is a photographer that did a whole photo series um, where he took microscopic photos of bees. Um, and so the, the biggest aspect that we, that we brought to this publication was this idea of an in-depth section where they feature 18 to 20 pages about a specific region and really sort of give the reader an in-depth look of all that they're doing in that place. So for the first issue, it was about um, this place called Primeras and Segundas, which is a, a chain of islands off the coast of Mozambique in Africa. So we start off with um, a really big, full-spread um, imagery or photograph that sort of introduces the, um, the section and then it has its own little TOC. And then we always feature some kind of infographic in this section um, that sort of tells a, tells a story about the place in a very visual way. So uh, in this case, it was a map, because I certainly had no idea where Primaris of Segundas was. Um, so a map sort of made sense to, to, um, to give the reader a sense of location. Sometimes it's in the form of um, a bunch of stati statistics. Um, and then sometimes it's more of a diagram. So this was, uh, the, the feature was about illegal fishing, actually. The whole in-depth section was about illegal fishing. Um, and so we did this, um, this infographic that sort of diagrammed um, the, the, fit, the fit caught fish's pro uh, process from, basically from bait to plate, so from catching to, to your plate. And then um, it always features a more lengthy, lengthily written story um, with that we use just like really, just really beautiful, um, big imagery. Um, letting print do what it does really well, and that show really big, beautiful photographs. This is um, a few of the spreads from that from that section. And sometimes there's, a, there's another section, like this one, uh, which talks about the species in the specific region. Um, and here, instead of showing images of the, of the species, we had them illustrated by this really great illustrator that did sort of these, these caricatures of, of the animals rather than showing uh, more realistic photos. Sort of a less expected take on that. And then again, like Excel in the, in the Chavez story, sometimes the, the pieces are more conceptual, and so they, um, they they're more suitable for illustration. Um, so this is one illustrated feature that we did. And then a lot of times uh, we suggest that a feature or two is, is done in a more infographic style. Um, a lot of their stories are pretty fact-riddled um, and can get sort of... Um, you can really get sort of bogged down in, um, in the writing. And so this was a feature about wildlife crime in America and the, and the impact um, here at home that, um, that it has on, on wildlife crime. And so they had written a, a sort of a full-length feature and weren't really sure what to do about the art. And we came back and said that it actually makes a lot more sense from a reader standpoint um, to, to break it up into a series of, of sort of infographics. So um, we, we broke the story up into um, these, the series of sections. So the, the different aspects are much more digestible um, and engage the reader in a much more effective way. Um, and then this is uh, one of my favorite features that we've done. Again, more of an infographic treatment. Um, this one sort of combined a more lengthy written story with infographics. So this told the story of three cities in the U.S. that are really um, sort of spearheading the, um, the movement against climate change. Um, and so we created these infographics, one for each city, that um, sort of told all of the different things that they're doing, but also were designed in a way that you could sort of compare so that each infographic was sort of templated um, so that you could really kind of hold them side by side and compare the different cities, um, sort of apples to apples. Um, and then this was uh, one of, another one of my favorites that we did. 
where we told the story almost entirely through a, through a timeline, a visual timeline. So it sort of starts up there at the top with the orange arrows and kind of winds its way around. Um, this was a feature about, about food. And so this timeline told the story of WWF's involvement in, um, in the food industry. Um, and so I'll leave you today with the biggest, certainly the biggest editorial project that I've worked on thus far, and that is the um, collaboration on the design and production of DJ's design book, which is a retrospective of his um, editorial career over the last 30 years. Um, just, it's coming out this month, um, and it was, uh, for me, five years in the making, probably more like ten years in the making for him. Um, he wrote a lot. There are a lot of really great anecdotes. This was a feature that he did uh, while he was working in at Texas Monthly. Um, but the whole book is organized by subject. So the first subject is animals, and this is the horse section. Um, being a guy from Texas, he has lots of, lots of horse stories. Um, this is the cows. Uh, we actually have these portraits, these cow portraits hanging in our office. It's another spread from the book. So we sort of, and this, we're getting into the, the water section. Um, so the um, the book is really sort of broken up by these longer, lengthier essays that sort of tell the story behind that, that particular project. Um, and then you have spreads where you just sort of have extended captions. But he had every single piece photographed. So um, this magazine was photographed. Um, everything was photographed, which was, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then if you ever hear DJ talk, you will quickly know that um, he is a Texan through and through. Um, he was born and raised in Texas. I think he says he's a sixth generation, which I sometimes question. Um, but uh, this was a project that he did for Sappy Paper Company, where they assigned various designers throughout the country a uh, different region of the, of the country and asked them to design a poster about that region. So he was hired to do the region of the Southwest. Um, and clearly he made it all about Texas. Um, and so the, the other states in the Southwest region are sort of shimmied in there and they all have really funny names. Um, and then Brownsville down there is indicated by the world's greatest citrus, I believe. So like I said, the book um, is released this month. Um, I'm a little bit biased, but it's a great book. Uh, you should definitely pick up a copy. It's not your typical um, coffee table design book. Uh, and that's it. This is the team. <laughs> <laughs>